Good evening. Welcome to SciArc. My name is David Rue. I'm the chair of postgraduate programs here at SciArc. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alexandra Lykoff to SciArc. Uh, Alexandra is a photographer, an artist, and she is uh, uh, practicing uh, out of Berlin. Uh, her work is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, very out there right now. Uh, the list of exhibitions in your bio uh, currently in recent time, it's quite long, you know. I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to read all of it, but it's posted on our website. I think it would be interesting for all of you to get to know her work. Uh, uh, Alexandra uh, was uh, um, she did her coursework at the Academy of Fine Arts in Nuremberg, Germany, and at the Gerard Riefeld Academy in Amsterdam. Uh, her recent solo exhibitions include uh, at the Caprona Focal Point Gallery, Cliché Ver in the gallery in Berlin. Uh, she was at the Pompidou. Uh, she was, took part in a number of group exhibitions uh, in recent years, and uh, she has been teaching at a number of uh, art academies recently, including at the Carpenter Center at Harvard, uh, University of the Arts Berlin, and she has a recent uh, monograph published by Roma Publishers uh, in 2016. Uh, it's, it's uh, what I wanted to do here was to just maybe, uh, if I could get the first slide here somehow. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. Uh, just want to, we are a school of architecture, and uh, I think photography has been uh, a preoccupation of architecture throughout the 20th century. Uh, we, those of us on the faculty and the students, we know well uh, the fascination of, say, a Le Corbusier or Mies van der Rohe in the, the opticality of modern space. And uh, I think uh, uh, just a few words here about uh, maybe the problem of photography uh, uh, adjacent to architecture and maybe some preoccupations that we have in relationship to this field. I put this first slide up uh, because uh, maybe this is a little bit more personal, but uh, for years, uh, most of my career, uh, I was preoccupied with this image which by uh, uh, Julius Schulman of the Stahl Residence, and uh, otherwise uh, known as Case Study House Number 22. And uh, uh, it was a kind of uh, uh, obsession uh, and uh, uh, so much of uh, my architectural interests are kind of bound up in a kind of odd way with this photograph and it took uh, uh, maybe a while for me to even uh, register, oh, I've never even been to the house. Now I've been in LA for two years and I still haven't been there. And uh, I have to uh, admit to myself, well, actually, I'm not interested in the building. I'm interested in the photograph. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, this, is, this kind of uh, uh, role that the image plays for the architect, I think, uh, uh, becomes kind of poignant with photographs of buildings that no longer exist, like this famous photograph of uh, the old Penn Station in New York City that was demolished and became a real catalyst in the uh, preservationist movement in New York City. And it's, a, it's an odd thing to have a, a, a masterpiece of architecture that exists only in, as an image uh, now. And uh, I think this too was kind of a, a, for me, a striking thing that I accidentally came across, which was just a random Twitter post, which was that photograph then placed in the new horrible Penn Station and kind of mise en abeam kind of uh, way, uh, kind of oriented uh, correctly relative to where that view was. And the weirdness of all of this is what we're actually looking at, if we're to be truly analytical about it, is we're looking at a photograph of a space 
that we desire that is then placed in a new space where it once was, but then that is also a photograph that's now placed on Twitter, and then I'm downloading it from Twitter, and now it's being projected onto the screen here. So the entire problem of viewing a photograph has become deeply complex, and I think uh, many of uh, the contemporary photographers that I admire, I think, are uh, pulling this problem of what it means to view a photograph uh, in, in interesting ways. And with that, uh, I would like to introduce you to Alexandra Lakoff, uh, who I think is one such artist that is doing interesting work with photography. Hello, <clears throat> I'm really happy to be here and I'm um, going to talk about my work for about an hour and you're very welcome to ask some questions um, afterwards. Um, I'd like to start with this image, it's from an, it's from an exhibition at um, the, a contemporary art center in Brussels, Wheels, and um, like so often I went there before the exhibition I took part of and um, found a curtain by Felix Gonzalez Torres that intrigued me because it separated um, two spaces and enhanced the theatricality that I saw in the smaller of those two spaces. And I took a photograph of it through the throughway connecting one first to the, to the second space, printed the image, um, Xerox technique, large black and white copies, and attached them to a wooden wall, um, blocking the view that I had when I took the photograph. On the second picture, you, yeah, you can see the throughway. So the viewer um, entering the space, in my imagination, came from behind the scene, from backstage, only to then find himself on stage, um, confronted with um, an image that he could not see because the stage architecture was actually blacking, um, blocking his view. And um, on the other hand, he would then see in front of him um, as a reproduction, what he could also see um, in his back, the windows and metal staircases of the old industrial building of um, the Contemporary Art Center. On the reverse side, <coughs> I, project, I projected a 16 millimeter film called Folding. And um, I uh, chose this particular 16 millimeter film because I saw an analogy to, in, in the setup of the film, um, to what I was doing with um, the poster, the photograph, the stage architecture. <clears throat> I um, folded um, a small origami object, photographed it, and then printed the photograph of that object, and um, folded the sheet again, into the very same origami object, and then took it apart step by step <clears throat> in the stop motion technique under the 16 millimeter camera. So it's sort of collapsing on itself and um, the picture of the three dimensional object is turning step by step into the picture of the picture of the object that you uh, already saw in the beginning. And um, this is one image of a series of works, 81 to be precise, from the year, from the years 2008, 2009. I was just um, playing around in my studio, building up small scenes, most of which I, um, yeah, considered architectural. From, from myself, I always called them staged architecture even though um, a lot of images I, I used had nothing to do with architecture. 
And um, yeah, like here, I projected the interior of a cinema space onto a curtain in my apartment. Or I cut a hole in a book and um, placed the light behind the page. And I didn't really know what to do with all the images I had taken. I did not want to present them as a series on the wall with um, fixed dimensions, because I back then really wanted to um, wanted the viewer to remember the the pure image. Wanted the viewer to remember um, the image without its dimensions, without its materiality. And I thought about when this is happening, when I myself remember an image as the image itself without thinking about inches and centimeters and um, framing, and realized that it's mostly in projections or um, within books. So I um, turned all the images into a slideshow. That's also why it's 81, because 81 fit into one slide carousel. And um, projected them into an exhibition space at the Musée de Moderne um, in Paris. There's um, a place called Salle Noire, which sounds really fancy, but in fact it's rather the heating basement of the Musée de Moderne. And it's meant for video projections. It's dark, gray, gray carpet, <clears throat> almost black walls, and then some white rectangles. And I sort of didn't want to give in to um, the architecture that was already there and almost forced me to show two or three videos in those projection booths. Um, so I switched on the light and took uh, three photographs, took me th three photographs to register the entire space which is as um, half, a half circle like the Musée d'Art Moderne. The Musée d'Art Moderne has those two curves, half circles towards the Seine, and they, of course, go down to the basement. And I mirrored the three images that I needed to depict the, the space and um, attached them as large black and white copies um, to the longest wall that I had used as an axis, um, that I had used as a standpoint um, for the camera. And then I projected um, the 81 slides totally astray on the floor, on the ceiling, onto the walls. And what it was for me back then was a mixture of um, obscuring the image and um, clarifying the image, something that I can say I'm still looking for in my work. So where the, um, where the slides hit the posters, you would actually see what the space would look like if the light was, would be switched on. But at the same time, um, the slides distributed on five slide projectors caused a really um, confusing atmosphere and were rather yeah, you rather lost your orientation, so it was that game of showing the architecture and concealing it. Another um, way of breaking up the photographic series on the wall was to um, print, print the images as posters and attach them to the wall directly and partly frame them, um, partly print them as silver gelatin prints, prints and then reassemble, um, re-collage for the next show, because I found it rather boring to show the same, the exact same series over and over again. So I thought, well, I'd rather develop something new for each um, space I'm showing at, change um, sizes and change material. And eventually, um, all the images turned into a book, where again, I was. Um, thriving for, for, yeah, for an image without its materiality, although, of course, it, it's printed on paper as well. <laughs> and um, the next work I want to show you is from, a, was shown in, um, in a small gallery space in Berlin. Very small gallery space, very high ceilings, um, 
but very narrow. And um, when I was invited for the exhibition, I, I at the same time rather accidentally uh, found an image of a Bavarian castle, Schloss Lustheim, which is um, a point de vue um, castle, um, meaning that it's not um, for official purposes, but it's um, on an axis from the main castle of Schleisheim, close to Munich, rather something um, to walk towards if you want to withdraw from all the hassle at the court, like a hideaway place, a um, pleasure castle. And I was thinking about um, all the images of castles that I had already seen and thought how strange that on the one hand um, the, the castle functions as a museum and um, most there's, there's always something on display inside the castle um, quite frequently. It's uh, roco rococo porcelain or old armory. But then the castle itself is um, the exhibited object so you go into the castle to see the castle. And that made me think that I want to um, take that thought, the doubling of the exhibition, exhibition space and show that image as it is, just folded because I adjusted the height of the image to the height of the exhibition space. But, but like that, it was far too um, wide to fit in. So I just folded it and um, had the raw wooden reverse side um, accessible through the front entrance. You could then um, access the ex exhibition space through um, a side door and yeah, be sort of in enclosed in the image, part of the image as I um, thought back then. And I um, continued thinking about display, display cases, what it means to display something in a vitrine in an exhibition space, and started to um, photograph freestanding vitrines in um, several museums. And um, freestanding because I wanted to take pictures of all four sides, uh, through two, always through two screens of glass. So you have um, one screen of glass, glass between camera and um, object on display, and then behind that, another screen of glass between vitrine and exhibition space. And my initial idea was to fold an, in, an entire interior around an object. How much space do I need to depict um, an entire exhibition space? To me, it felt like turning a glove um, inside out, condensing that entire space onto yeah, the narrow corpus, the not narrow small body of the vitrine. But then, because of the perspective of the camera, you, of course, have dead angles at the corners and um, some reflections, too. And what you, what's missing is what you always expect in a museum changing perspectives and the other viewers behind the glass. I also wanted to combine different exhibition spaces, um, different museums in one um, than contemporary exhibition space. Conflate all those spaces into one so that you'd, as you as a viewer would have the impossible um, position not only between the um, uh, different spaces in, in a museum, but, but even between different museums, different interiors. This last one is from the Carpenter Center. In um, yeah, it was the pictures before were various um, exhibition spaces, um, and that's this one is from the Carpenter Center. I'll come back to that 
in a few minutes. And this one, as the minimum model of a room, again, um, thinking about what you need to open an image space, what you need to um, depict an interior, to depict a space. And in my work, I've always tried to um, think about the economics of means, always try to reduce the means as far as possible um, and still um, give information. And I'm over and over, I'm surprised how little uh, how little quality, how, how simple the means can be, um, and, and still you have um, the illusion of depth, the illusion of an image space opening up. So again, I was invited for a show and I built a model according to the proportions of the um, exhibition space, um, which is then just a cardboard box, cut it open, opened it towards the camera, and um, attached the photograph, printed as big black and white copies to a wooden structure that um, um, worked against um, the perspective of the image. So all the corners that um, in the image are um, protruding, are residing and all the residing corners are protruding. And yeah, that's something that I um, always come back to in my work, sort of a conflict between image space and actual space. And yeah, trying to find out what's stronger, but always giving the viewer the, the possibility to um, yeah, break the trompe effect that um, any image produces by making the reverse side accessible. Or like in the first um, picture I showed, um, by pointing out the stageness of um, the work on show. So also here you could access, walk around the piece, access the reverse side and also break the trompe effect. If you take one step aside, the illusion of the cardboard box falls apart <laughs> and the actual architecture of the wooden construction becomes stronger than the image. A book that I found in a library, a book on library buildings, library architecture, a chance find. I was looking for something else and then opened the book. On this very page, the caption says, a student at ease amongst the books. And I thought, oh, how strange. I'm in the exact same position. I'm at ease um, amongst the books, holding a book um, that shows me a student amidst library architecture. Uh, the depiction is actually illustrating library shelving and how to do it well. And this image um, was very dear to me immediately because I was always thinking about the book as a container, as an interior in itself, not only as um, an object, or as a means for transferring information, but also as something like a box or a, a room that opens up infinite possibilities. <laughs> and I printed the image larger than life, so that again, you'd, you as a viewer would feel yourself um, amidst the image and encompassed by the image. And you could be not only amongst the books, but also between the now enlarged pages of the book. And that's at um, Art Center in Serignan, southern France. Where I showed a combination of images attached to wooden constructions. And, and this piece 
again in the Carpenter Center. That's how I came up with um, this particular image, an open book, um, a volume, but um, with a missing spine. So if you look at the open book like that, you have all the spaces between the individual pages all pointing towards um, an Im yeah, imaginary spine. You just know that it's there, whereas, in fact, the reverse side is just hollow. And um, I chose the image because I was invited to participate in a show um, in celebration of the 50th, uh, 50th anniversary of the Carpenter Center, the only Le Corbusier building in Northern America. And um, like always, Le Corbusier uh, showed a variety of um, solutions for windows. And these ondulatoires, as he calls them, are um, my favorites. Also because of the rhythm that they show, there are hardly two equal distances between the concrete separations of the window panes. And walking along them, seeing the light change as you walk along the ondulatoires, those stripes reminded me a lot of leaving through a book, browsing through a book. Um, just that with the construction I'm showing you here, I reversed the curve of the architecture. And on the reverse side, again, I um, showed a 16 millimeter film of um, a Bauhaus experiment in the architecture class of Hans Kollein. Um, Hans Kollein gave his students the assignment to uh, take a photograph of virtual volume. And um, they partly came up with a solution to um, work with a solution to work with long time exposures. Like in this image here, they attached two rods onto a rotating disc and then photographed the rotating rods with a long exposure time. And like that, um, you, yeah, just what the assignment was comes into being a virtu virtual volume. And I um, sort of revived uh, the experiment and turned images, depictions of the Bauhaus experiment into a, something like a revolving door and um, again had it on a rotating disc and filmed it while it was rotating. And again, the photograph of that experiment, of that virtual volume, turns into another virtual volume because that small paper structure is moving f faster and slower in the 16 millimeter film. And well, you've seen quite some wooden constructions. And by now, um, their origin is always a paper model. I work a lot with models of the exhibition space, but also of my work in the exhibition space to communicate ideas, but also to come up with ideas to just play around and see for myself what can be done with images. But um, using wooden constructions, uh, constructions always limited me to rather straightforward um, walls. Um, well, the book one was the most elaborate one, whereas my paper models are sometimes um, quite different. And then I um, found a technique um, that allowed me to come closer to my models, and that, that was uh, silk screening on uh, aluminum. And um, in here, I, in this image, I um, printed a photograph of two carpets in perspective onto a sheet of um, aluminum and then rolled it up as you would do with a carpet. Or um, this one shows an, a um, Turkish Osmanic tent. And um, that's the large scale version about as big as a telephone booth. I again found um, this image in a book and thought how strange, um, what a strange doubling of um, the interior is of the, the image was um, 
printed in a catalog of the Wabel collection in Krakow. And um, in 1680-something, the um, Turks besieged Vienna and the Polish king helped to free Vienna and um, took King Sultan Mustafa's tent away ever since it's been on display in Krakow. And I, was, uh, I found it endearing how um, Sultan Mustafa took his oriental garden to war, because that's what the interior of the tent is. It's um, applic um, applications of an oriental garden, fountains, leafage, flowers. So he takes the skin-thin separation between inside and outside that a tent is, to war, to then um, make even that skin-thin separation disappear and make it look like he would be in nature, just in a completely different climate, because yeah, he's coming from Turkey besieging Vienna, whereupon it's taken away from him and um, inserted into, again, a different climate, into a museum in Krakow, where it's doubling um, the exhibition space. You can see that on, um, on the wooden floor and the sharply cut doors that you wouldn't be able to see if it would be standing where it's supposed to be, outside in nature. And again, I um, try to um, build up a conflict between the image space and the actual space. Um, the image space sort of um, bursting open, the telephone booth-sized um, metal alu aluminum construction. An, an example again from the Carpenter Center. So I, I took, um, I was a bit overwhelmed by the assignment to pay contribute to tribute to um, Le Corbusier and. Um, I ended up uh, choosing two features of the building, the ondulatoires that I just showed you and the concrete entrance into the building. And um, looking at the concrete entrance, I um, yeah, thought it's uh, an upside down U pushed through the window pane. And I simulated that by just bending um, a card, folding a cardboard strip and attaching it to a mirror, took a picture of it and then printed it large, a similar principle to the cardboard box that I showed you where I worked against um, the perspective of the, of the image and also allowed you to um, either see the a reflection of the cardboard strip or see the actual cardboard strip um, depending on your point of view. And what's um, quite prominent in this work is um, and what I like to play with is the change of scale. You need very little to get a sense of um, scale. Just a small um, mistake in the surface of the Cardboard is enough to give you an idea of the size of the model and sort of play or be confused about your own size in relation to the work. Is, are you, are you, is it a shrinking that takes place? Um, are you sort of dwarfed in front of um, an image that clearly tells you that it's maybe 10 centimeters high or um, well, what, what, what does the, the enlargement of something that you're familiar with um, do with your surrounding, with the exhibition space itself, the architecture surrounding it? And speak, speaking of um, Volumes, virtual volumes, actual volumes, reversal processes. Um, I also want to show you this work where I um, made plaster casts of the five platonic bodies. And um, 
well, you need two parts if you want to make a cast because you want to open it again, want to be able to open it again. Um, and I um, then opened them, painted the insides of the casts in the four um, primary colors and photographed them with a slide film. And if you use a slide as a negative and print it on, on a photo paper, then what you get is, of course, again, a negative of the slide positive, um, which is what you see here. So that's um, the uh, photographed with a different camera and a different film. The plaster mold, and you can see the depth, the um, negative of um, the pyramid shape, one of the platonic bodies, and then everything you see is reversed in the negative that comes into being. If you print the slide, everything that's white is black, the white plaster turns black, and all the primary colors just switch position. So in here I wanted to combine a photographic and a sculptural um, process. Here's the five bodies and the two halves of, of the octagon. More casts. Um, I've uh, found photographs of movie interiors and um, yeah, like David said, um, that's, if we see photographs of architecture that doesn't even exist anymore. And that's maybe why I um, work a lot with found photographs because they immediately um, trigger my wish to see more. It gets stronger as it's um, not possible to see more because the building doesn't exist anymore. Like so many um, movie theaters that have been demolished in the last 50, 60 years. And I chose a couple of images that um, showed a theater from a rather extreme perspective, so not central perspectives, but um, rather dramatized by the photographer. And imagine what um, they would look like if um, they would be able to um, ex um, protrude into space. And I made plaster, I made clay models of those reliefs, of those popped up photographs, and um, then cast them and made um, paper mache casts. They look a lot a lot like concrete, but they're really lightweight. I chose paper mache because I um, wanted to allude to stage architecture, which is now not made of paper mache anymore, but in my mind, paper mache is sort of an archetypical material for stage architecture, for props. And what I wanted to um, see is whether you can, um, well, look at a photograph, look at um, uh, you know, the perspective um, uh, sealed in a photograph from a different angle. And that's, um, yeah, that's why, what I wanted to show myself. So you can either follow the given perspective or work against it and come from a different angle. And the, the more different the angle from the original camera perspective, the more abstract the relief gets. Another attempt to revive old photographs, to bring them back to life. I found um, images of mostly 19th century interiors, um, all of which were stuffed with um, trophies, pictures, paintings, um, decoration, and almost all of them um, showed Oriental, Middle Eastern, Asian carpets on couches, on the wall, layered on the floor, on daybeds, um, as 
unnecessary accessory for the bourgeois interior of the 19th century. And I first I didn't know what I found so intriguing about them, and then I realized that, um, again, it's um, the conflict between what is um, intrinsically a two-dimensional image, image space, or better, the absence of the image space as um, we find it, find it in, um, in carpets, a different concept of um, what an image is, namely ornamental, two-dimensional, um, without direction, without um, the opposition of vantage point and um, vanishing point accessible from all sides. And the perspective that the photo, photographer, that the camera forces onto um, these different image spaces for lack of a word for <laughs> what then a carpet is or what, uh, what it is that we see on a carpet. And on the one hand, I wanted to free the carpets and um, give them back some life. That's how I started coloring them, just um, for the fun of it. And on the other hand, I found that because of the perspective, the strange, strange perspective that's forced onto those um, carpets where it shouldn't be, and the carpets on, are maybe coming closer to what they also are, more mobile pieces of land, um, oriental gardens, and the first carpets um, mostly depicted paradise scenes, and the oriental garden is uh, modeled after an idea of paradise, which um, in a lot of tales all over the world has that idea of a central well or fountain, and then rivers departing to the four quarters of the earth or of the garden. And that's what we can still find in Renaissance and Baroque um, garden design, where, where you always have four segments, four quarters, divided by water and a central um, fountain. And then um, thinking of nomads taking um, woven carpets with them, um, they actually take their garden with them, or um, a, mo yeah, a mobile piece of land, their territory, a mobile territory. And by, um, by putting them in perspective, I thought that the carpets are becoming more landscape here again. Are, yeah. turning into an actual ter territory more than they would be if you, more than they would if you would just see the carpet on the floor. And that made me combine um, the colored silver gelatin prints with depictions of early landscape paintings, um, just around the time when um, landscape painting evolved as an independent genre. So before that, in landscape painting, you mostly had something like a world landscape, um, a symbol for God's creation where you have a bit of everything. You have mountains and you have um, the sea and you have rivers and um, fields, but it's not an actual landscape. It's just a placeholder for, yeah, for God's creation. And then around um, in the late 1600s, um, you then all of a sudden um, have a new interest in the territory, in measuring the land in an actual landscape, in um, portraying a landscape. All of a sudden you get um, the names of a, a specific place as a caption, and um, you also have a new joy, pleasure in painting, for painting's sake, and for the joy of gifts to depict nature as precisely as possible. Um, to have as much realism as possible in painting as opposed to symbolizing what you want to trans transfer. So I chose um, a series of those early landscape paintings and um, combined them with my colored silver gelatin prints. And also, not accidentally, that's the time when um, Europe started to colonize the world, a bit before that, of course. 
And that's also the time when the first carpets come into Europe, um, still very precious and um, not like in the 19th century, seen in all those bourgeois apartments, but um, yeah, rather as, as treasures. When you have, um, all of a sudden have colonies and outposts and, and different relationship towards um, the land, what land is. All of a sudden land becomes something that you can measure and possess it's not about God's creation anymore. It's something, um, yeah, that you can conquer and destroy, like this one, <laughs> a burned carpet that's being renovated. This brings me to um, this work. I was invited to a small exhibition space across to Hanover, and it's a bowling alley, one bowling alley, so it's basically a tube, um, a corridor-shaped exhibition space. And um, I didn't really know what to do with it until I thought I, I really want to play with um, this effect of elongated, elongating and um, shortening that I felt I produced in one um, slide piece. I um, asked a friend to walk from the horizon towards the camera and pictured him in 80 steps, in 80 slides. So in the first image, he's just a dot on the horizon. And in the last image, he's um, frame filling really close to the camera. And then I re reproduced those 80 slides. Um, projected them on a reversal screen, but I um, moved the slide projector um, closer and closer to the projection screen. And when the slide projector is really close, you have a tiny, tiny frame, and if it's really far away, it's, it, it can project yeah, as large as you wish. And um, But I uh, reversed the logic so that in the image furthest that shows um, the figure um, as a dot on, her, on the horizon, the image is maximum, maximally uh, blown up. But in um, the last slide where you see the figure really close to the camera, the frame is um, tiny. So that um, I ended up having the figure always the same size in all the reproduction slides. And um, for me, it was a way of um, yeah, setting up, again, the image against um, its te technical um, uh, uh, premises, having, having the technical givens work against the image space. And the next images are of... Um, uh, 35 film, millimeter film I shot um, mounted on carpet, one of those carpets that I described, one that has four quarters and a well a fountain in the middle onto a wooden board and um, rotated it so that you um, half the time see the black or don't see anything, just um, sort of uh, go underneath the ground and uh, only see darkness, blackness, and the other half um, shows you different, as you can see, different, dis different stages of distortion of um, the carpet's front side. And this is um, of um, a courtyard in Berlin. It's from a yeah, bookshop, was invited to do something with the courtyard. And it has all those uh, vitrines on the walls. I um, enlarged, again, one of those first landscape paintings, Hillis van Konigslo's um, Forest, and um, glued it on top of the frames. I was also thinking of um, Alberti's demand. Alberti's um, 
15th century, one of the, uh, actually the, the first um, art critic ever, and he, um, in the early times of Renaissance, he well, made some demands, some postulations, what painting should do, what painting should be uh, in the um, gist of a new um, turn towards realism and yeah, joy in depicting nature as mimetically as possible. And he demanded that a painting should be like an open window so that you um, should, as a viewer, ideally, not see, see the difference between um, the world outside your window and the painting imaginarily next to that window, that it should uh, feel like um, you can actually go there. So that, that was also in the back of my mind when I posted over the frame, thought I got reversing Alberti's demand. When all of a sudden the image is blocking the view on top of the frame rather than opening behind it. Something that reminded me a lot of a laptop. <laughs> the way I view quite some paintings. And, and a tree, initially to give some indication of um, the depiction of another landscape painting, Caspar David Friedrich's Monk at the seaside. And also a way for me to um, conflate two spaces, the photographic one, between the pages of the book and the camera and the painterly one opening behind or into the pages of the book. To me, those um, three images are um, more similar than I seem. I was thinking of the Etui as, well, of, obviously also as a container, um, something that, um, yeah, in, it's, a, it's an Etui for glasses that um, contains um, some, something that helps you see, and the mirror as a means to reassure yourself of who you are, meditation by the sea, but also looking at yourself. And I thought that both the mirror and the tree are very similar to what a telephone is. That it's a means to reassure yourself of who you are, but also a container for all the images that you take, a container for all the spaces that you've been to and that you now put into your iPhone. And again, I wanted to measure my interior, my wardrobe um, against um, an image space of a me medieval painting. And yeah, get closer to it, make it more ac ac accessible for me. And in that case, I also wanted to play with the leafage, concealing, the interior of the forest and the leafage of the clothes on the wardrobe. All those photographs that I showed you lately, since the laptop on the desk, are printed in the original size of the depicted paintings. I was puzzled by the way paintings are changed when they are depicted in books. I think that actually new works come into being. Um, we don't think about it anymore, whether we see paintings um, reproduced on computer screens or in a book. It's so um, well natural to us that um, 
that's what you get, reproduction of a painting. Whereas I think um, apart from the change of material, obviously it's uh, offset print on paper instead of um, oil on canvas, uh, new works come into being because of the change of scale. You, you are looking at miniatures, whereas in a museum um, we are maybe having a large scale painting and, um, and it's so important how we relate to an artwork, whether we relate to it physically and can walk past it, um, take a step back, take a step forward, or whether we um, engage purely mentally by looking at the pages um, of a book and really um, well, looking at it like, as if we would be looking at a miniature um, where we can't build up a physical relationship to it, but are um, only, only eyes. <laughs> and I then wanted to see what's happening if I enlarge the books again to a scale that um, yeah, matches the original scale of the painting. Um, whereby, of course, then um, my telephone on the book pages becomes enlarged too and indicates the photographic space. Here you well, can maybe see more clearly what I just tried to explain. So the Lucian Freud painting on the right side, for example, that's um, one meter or 40 by one meter 30 whereas the left one is only seven, 50 by 70 centimeters. And another attempt to make paintings more familiar to myself, um, to bring them to my interior, to, um, well, maybe have them with me as opposed to look at them in awe in the museum. I filmed paintings in, landscape paintings in museums, holding my telephone without tripod, and then looked at it, filmed myself looking at the filmed paintings, so that you sort of have a double trace of my own body the one where I was holding the telephone in the museum and the second one where I'm filming myself looking. Yeah, that's a video called um, Cliché Vert. I um, applied paint, black paint, on a um, glass plate 
and filmed myself wiping it clean until bit by bit my interior becomes visible. I call it cliché verb because it's a technique that 19th century landscape painters used um, quite a bit. Um, they uh, blackened a glass plate with soot and then scratched um, a drawing into that glass plate and it's, it's an early technique of reproduction because if you then put um, the glass plate on photosensitive paper you get a black drawing on a white background because uh, um, the black soot blocks the light so that only where um, the soot is scratched away you then um, have light transgressing onto the photographic paper exposing it and therefore um, leaving you with an image of your drawing. And um, in this video again, uh, my wish to um, go into the image, to um, transgress the surface and um, make the image accessible to um, my, my belief in the image space, although I sadly realize over and over again that it's of course not possible to be there. And I, um, after I had tried that out, had done that video, I um, decided that I could actually print the halfway cleaned glass plates like those landscape painters in the 19th century did. And I was invited to another exhibition in Berlin, in my Berlin gallery, where I um, blackened the entire window front and wiped it partially clean and then um, printed it with photographic paper by pressing the photo paper against the window and then building up a dark room in the exhibition space, um, developing um, the photo paper that I had pressed against the window screen so that, again, everything that is covered, still covered with black paint, is, um, appears white on the silver gelatin prints and everything that's wiped clean appears black and a more large-scale version of that in the Focal Point Gallery in South End in England. To me, it's, um, I, would, I would never call it painting, because I'm not a painter. It's a photo, clearly photographic technique. It's more something, but it, for, for me, it um, has quite a painterly effect, although it's just my hands wiping clean. So it's in a way also a reversal of painting and sort of negative painting, taking something away um, instead of building something up. Two close-ups and over to the next. I think I've um, arrived at this last group of works because of the cliché verse, because of the prints um, of glass screens that I had done, because I was thinking of the relationship between um, a painting mostly looked at the wall vertically, where, as I said before, you have that um, opposition of vantage point and vanishing point, and you as a viewer are in the center. Um, you have a rather fixed position opposite the vanishing point. And um, the phot photographic analog process of developing um, an image in the dark room where you put the exposed photo paper into um, a chemical developing developer bath and you see the image appear um, simultaneously at all corners. And that's so different from um, the process of painting that always encompasses a time where a painter starts at one corner and then slowly proceeds um, until he's finished. Photography is not only very different from that in its um, initial um, capturing of an image with the camera, but also in the developing process where everything appears out of the depth um, simultaneously. And um, while I was in South End in the county of Essex in England, I found um, photographs of, um, I found aerial views of um, the Essex landscape. Um, 
it started in the Second World War when um, the military was uh, surveying the landscape, the land, not the landscape. <laughs> And um, later, archaeologists made, made use of those aerial views because they realized that it's such, an, um, such a fantastic tool for archaeology because you can see um, hidden foundations and remainders of um, partly long forgotten cultures in the growth of plants. Not always, but um, mostly um, early summer when uh, you have the crop turning yellow and ditches in the ground will produce green lines in a yellow cornfield. And that's because um, a ditch will contain, contains water that allows the plants to stay green longer than the neighboring crop. Or the other way around, um, if you have um, walls, foundations underneath a meadow, for example, the roots of the grass um, are blocked um, and can't soak up as much water as they would like to. So you have yellowish lines in a meadow. And it's not um, that you can see a relief on the surface of the earth. It's um, maybe an entirely flattened field and the structures, the drawings on the land that you can see in those aerial photographs, they are just due to the mediation of um, the plant growth. And I, I was really fascinated by that um, because I, I, I immediately thought of the developing process of photography, of ana analog photography, where everything appears out of, out of uh, the depth brings um, the the um, um, chemicals bring something to light that was hidden uh, in the exposed but not developed photograph before. And here you um, can, yeah, that's an aerial view of Woodham Walter. And what you see if you actually go there, which I did, um, I just wanted to see for myself. <laughs> There, as you can see, there's nothing there. But underneath that field, everything that you saw before, everything, whatever that is, but a lot took place. So it's probably round burrows. That they indicate burial sites and um, maybe some, some outlines of um, bigger buildings, not necessarily from the same culture and from the same period. Sometimes uh, the structures overlap and indicate that um, there's, there have been settlements, different settlements through the centuries and through, um, through time. One culture didn't know of the other and just built a house on the same spot. But um, the plants sort of know and bring it all to light. <laughs> It's an example of um, yeah, more water being contained, probably a um, um, groove, ditch, and the other way around, brown lines. And I, um, back then I had a pocket scanner and I was so excited about uh, all those findings in the library um, that I immediately wanted to take them with me and scan them, and then I thought, well, why not? Why not see what's happening if I scan them against um, the light, against the window? So I held the book pages, um, the books um, against the windows, and scanned, scanned them, so that you have um, two images uh, blurring into each other, which I found quite fitting for the idea of something coming through from underneath the surface. And I had that whole collection of scans and. Scans blur blurring into d different depictions of aerial views blurring into each other. As if you could see them from below the ground. So you have one image from the top and then you have one um, as if you would be deep under the ground and l looking, looking up towards the surface like in a swimming pool looking at the surface of the water. I also had to think a lot of Google View because 
whenever I go to a place that I'm not familiar with, I, tr like all of us now, um, try to orient myself by um, zooming in, zooming out, trying, out, trying to find out where I have to go, go looking at satellite views. And I thought that maybe um, that's about the time when a shift in the way we look at images um, occurred. That old idea of a landscape needing to be viewed vertically on the wall um, made way for a different, um, different approach to the land, landscape. Don't want to really go into the differences between nature and landscape and however we want to call it. Um, which is a rather um, horizontal view and also a more and more technical view. If you think of satellite views, it's actually a disembodied eye. Whereas if we look at a perspective painting of landscape, we are still there um, in front of the painting. If we look at satellite views, nobody is there. It's, it's, um, it's an, an invisible eye in the sky that's um, surveying everything. And the question, of course, also whether um, it's more, it's got something more oppressive, whether power is more, m more visible because, just because it's um, less visible. You, if you have a photographer and you have a human being um, opposite a vertical <laughs> painting, it's a different relationship. You, you have, you have um, something to address, whereas um, the satellite view, is uh, something entirely technical and therefore, well, maybe more worrying. Howls of forgotten ships, shipwrecks. But not only ancient cultures, um, Saxons and Britons and Romans, also um, remainders of the Second World War, like those bunkers or airfields that have been turned into golf courses. Or like here, where you can, um, within the boundaries of, um, within the boundaries of the hatches surrounding the fields, you can see other lines indicating um, former field boundaries. You can see how all those territories of the farmers have been shifting. In that case, um, the grid of a city shining through um, to a field that's showing, it's not really clearly visible there, a Roman road. Another road that turned into a yeah, ditch that appears green. All that combined, the idea of the satellite view and um, scanning the earth, um, dragging landscape through our computer screen, and, um, and the idea of something appearing from, from the depth and those different um, layers, different um, sides of the book page, then turned into quite a long video that I did where I, um, combined the scans into a f video and combined it with um, the sound of me wandering around um, at some of the places that I found depicted. So like in the first images of Woodham Walter, I actually went there, not to all the places, but to some, and just recorded myself um, strolling around. Um, there's it's nothing spectacular, it's just some grass and my steps and sometimes a train and sometimes um, a truck. And I, I never f saw anything there. It was just shops and fields. And because, of course, I had a, the, the foot passenger um, perspective that doesn't reveal what's revealed in the aerial views. And also maybe because it was the wrong time of the year so that the plants didn't reveal anything.
And to the last works, um, I'm in the midst of uh, working on them, so I can probably say, um, can't, can't really say that much about them yet, but um, about the technique. I soaked velvet in cyanotype liquid. Cyanotype is an old photographic technique where you mix two chemicals and um, become a light sensitive liquid, um, get a light, get a light sensitive liquid that you then um, can spread on paper. Maybe you've seen, maybe you know Anna Atkins, um, who's, uh, who was a biologist's daughter and um, depicted plants like that. She did photographs with plants, that's cyanotype. And I found out that you can actually soak cloth in that liquid. And I think I used velvet because of the video I've done and because of all the aerial views that I found and because um, the, those surfaces reminded me a lot of velvet and of carpets. I was talking to Natasha earlier and she uh, pointed that out too and said that it reminds her so much of carpets again and of, um, well, the velvety surface. And um, then I, uh, again, tried to measure myself measure my own body against those surfaces and um, spread my clothes on it. For me, those prints resemble landscapes too. Some are um, aerial views from the top, more like um, maps. Some rather have a horizon line again. I used uh, different, I'm still using different colors of velvet and then the blue appears um, in different colors too. If you use a yellowish velvet, then you, of course, get rather green, a rather green print. So that's, I would like to end my lecture with those images. And um, I'd be happy about questions. <laughs>